before we start our guest speaker, I want to go over your note sheet that you have. So if you'll just take a look at it really quick. Make sure your name is on the top. Guest speaker, Matt Dare, his name's up there on the board, on the projector. So you can put that in so we know. The presentation topic, what should we write down for the presentation topic? History, biology. Climate change, and cutthroat trout. Okay, can we just go with cutthroat trout since it's kind of a small line? Climate change, I think we know climate change, but as long as it says cutthroat, we can look at that. Under presentation, <coughs> cut for Okay, now this is just to help keep your thoughts organized as we're going through and talking about. Um, remember, at the end, you're going to have a species and you're going to write a paragraph, do a flow diagram what's going on, or interpret a dance about how climate change affects that animal. We looked at one from the black bear yesterday. So this is just a place for you to keep track of your ideas as we go along. Um, there's a spot to write down some things about ecology, but what's ecology to study up? Kelly? Okay, something true but be more um, scientific. Isn't it the study of biosphere? Something different, CJ? Okay, Eli? Information about information about the organisms interaction with the other organisms. Okay, pause that right there. Addison? The study of an ecosystem. Levi, what's an ecosystem? It's uh um Thomas, help All the abiotic and all the biotic factors, right? Flip the page over so you see the side where it says abiotic and biotic factors. So you're going to have to have the ecosystem on there. Well, ecology, but ecology is really the study of ecosystems. The ecosystems are really just biotic and abiotic factors. They're just kind of places for you to record what's going on about this animal the best that you can, the species. In this case, the cutthroat trout. Um, so don't stress out about this, but if you hear something that you think might be helpful to you in explaining how the cutthroat is affected by climate change, you can go ahead and jot that down. Don't stress on these, just use these to jot down your ideas. If there, you think there's a good idea and you don't know which side it should go on, just write it somewhere and we can figure that out later. Questions on this before we start? Okay. I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Good morning, everybody. This is Dr. Matthew Dare, <coughs> GMUD Forest Service, which is the Grand Mesa Uncompagre and Medicine Nas National Forest Service. He's a fishery biologist and he's come to us this morning all the way from Delta. So he had a really long drive, and I hope you can show him good attention like you showed me and Jamie yesterday. Thank you. Um, and I also wanted to mention under biology that these things might be important. It's sort of how your species functions, so how they survive, and um, what their special features and special behaviors and adaptations are. So if you hear about those things as we have our speakers in the coming week, write them down because it might make sense later, oh, okay, so if the climate is warming or if the water temperature is um, warming or if there's less water, that might affect how many eggs the species can lay or something. So just try to use these sheets to gather as much information about the species in question, and thank you so much for coming in, Dr. Dare. And uh, I want you to each also keep in mind at least two questions as you hear uh, each speaker's presentation this week, because if you only have one question, chances are somebody else has that question. If we have time for question and answer at the end, and nobody's asking questions, we'll just call on you to ask a question. So everybody should come up with one educated question. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Dr. Dare sounds like a DJ, so you can just call me Matt. Um, and I apologize in advance. I never know how big these screens are going to be, so if you're sitting in the back, do not kill your eyes trying to see all the small print. I'll read most everything that I want you to get. Um, and as Alexander said, I work for the United States Forest Service in the big city of Delta. Um, I braved the drive through hundreds of elk this morning to get here, so and I'm glad to be out of Delta because it's hot and dry and dusty and windy there. So we're going to be talking about climate change and cutthroat trout, and specifically in western Colorado where we all live. 
And so I want to encourage you to interrupt me with questions if you don't understand something or you have an idea. I've got lots of places in the presentation where I'm going to ask you to tell me something. But if you've got something really gnawing at you, please interrupt me. We should have plenty of time to talk and learn together. And so first I want to ask, does anyone in the room have a definite opinion about climate change, one way or the other? Just if you, if the answer is yes, it's a yes-no question. Like, do you really firmly believe it's horrible and happening? Do you firmly believe it's not happening? Does anyone have an opinion one way or the other? Yeah? Good? 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 Good. Here's the thing. It doesn't matter. So whether you think it's cars and trucks and people, or whether you think it's Lord Voldemort, it doesn't matter. In the Forest Service and in my job, we have scientific evidence, some that I'm going to share with you today, that stream temperatures in the western U.S. have warmed. And we know a lot about the biology and ecology of stream fish, and we know that just the little bit of warming that has happened in the last few decades is causing effects. Now, that doesn't matter that we could enter an ice age in 10 years from now, or things could get hotter and hotter and hotter for the next several decades. But my agency, the federal government, is beholden by a number of laws to try to work to protect these animals. So we don't really spend much time debating, is climate change real, is climate change a hoax, is it whatever. We have to address it, and that's what I'm going to share with you today. All right? All right. So when I first took a course in college called ichthyology, the professor who taught it, whose name was Herb Lennon, he devoted half of the first lecture to making sure we understood this. So I always start my lectures with this, which is the grammatical correctness of fish versus fishes. Okay, so it's fish if you're talking about one species, like cup or trout or this puffer fish, okay? If you have a whole bunch of different species together in an aquarium or in the ocean or in a stream, it's fishes. That's grammatically correct to say fishes. So if it's cutthroat trout and brown trout, that's fishes. Except if you go to the grocer and they're all dead, then it reverts to being fish. Because the fish you eat, no matter what it is, is just fish. A half an hour of my time in college was devoted to learning this. So I condensed it into 45 seconds. OK, so here we have a um, little slice of heaven called delta. You guys are right there at the red dot with me today. The black polygons outline the, or delineate the Grand Mesa Uncompahgre and Gunnison National Forest. We have the Uncompahgre Plateau here. This is Navarita Creek. Uh, this is most of the Uncompahgre National Forest here. And all of this is the Gunnison National Forest. OK, so let's talk a little bit about the kinds of trout that you might find in streams and lakes in Colorado. Who goes out and fishes for fun, for family, friends? Streams, lakes, fly fish, bait fish, doesn't matter. Fishing is totally fun. Used to do it until it became my job, and now I don't really do it anymore unless my dad says, will you take me fishing some? So let's talk about rainbow trout. Rainbow trout are really cool. Rainbow trout are native to the west coast of North America, from northern Mexico all the way up into Alaska. They are not native to Colorado, OK? They're also called steelhead. Has anyone heard that term, steelhead? Yeah, steelhead is just a rainbow trout that goes out into the ocean like a salmon and then comes back a couple years later super huge and makes babies. And in places like Idaho and Nevada, they call them red band trout. They can move long distances. Steelhead going up the Colombian Snake Rivers into Idaho from the Pacific Ocean go over 900, sometimes almost 1,000 miles just to spawn. Does anyone know what spawn means? Does everyone know what spawn means? What does it mean? Shout it out. To breed. Yeah, to breed, to make babies, right? And they're very important for food and recreation. Fishing in Colorado is a $7 billion a year industry, largely because of rainbow trout. And also, in places like Idaho, where I came from before I moved here, there are places that grow rainbow trout in hatcheries specifically to provide food. All right? So they're very important economically. All right? They spawn in the spring. And you can find rainbow trout everywhere. Anyone caught a rainbow trout? Pretty much everyone, yep. Okay, brook trout. Brook trout are an amazing animal, but they are native east of the Mississippi River. They are not native to Colorado, all right? They are a very different species than rainbow trout. They're usually small. Where, if you've caught them, where have you caught them? Fishing, 
Shout it out. Nirmani, where else? Like out little little streams, beaver ponds. You often find brook trout in beaver ponds. They really do well in beaver ponds. Attention teachers, you may have difficulty taking attendance this morning because when we first built the school calendar, Go Edge Star is thinking that today was the day off and that day has been moved to tomorrow. So it's looking like we do not have school today. Please just take manual attendance until I can fix this problem for you and we can get it in later. Thank you. And by the way, that's baloney because I had to take it to the ACT on a Saturday. And I also had to take it to the SAT the next Saturday. Oh, you get a day off a week. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm just asking, uh, there, are there really brook trout in there, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah there are pretty much brook trout everywhere. Oh. They are, um, they are a very adaptable animal. Probably not a lot. Miramani's a little warm, and probably not right now, because Parks and Wildlife just poisoned Miramani to try to get the smallmouth bass out. But there's, I have no doubt that they can find their way into Miramani. Good question. All right, so the thing about brook trout is, where I grew up and went to school in the eastern United States, they are taken in, in the shorts from rainbow trout and brown trout and other things that have been stocked on top of them. But they've been transplanted into Colorado, and turns out they are really scrappy and they compete really well with the native trout in the western United States. And in fact, the number one threat to native cutthroat trout in Colorado is not climate change, it's not water use, it's brook trout, okay? They spawn in the fall. So unlike rainbow trout, they spawn in the fall. Usually in October, around the second week of October. And they can be found usually in small streams throughout Colorado. Yes, miss? Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. So hold that question. The question was, did everyone hear that? What do I mean by they compete? We'll talk about that in a second. Good question. Really good question. Okay, so let's talk about brown trout. Cool. Yeah, they're really cool fish. Unfortunately, they're not even native to North America. They're native to Europe and Western Asia. And they were brought here because they get big. They're obviously a really pretty animal. Um, they've been stocked all over the world for recreation, and if you're a fly angler, you may have read on the internet or in magazines about going to Chile in South America or going to uh, New Zealand, where brown trout have been stocked and they grow super huge, and they're really fun to catch. They grow to a large size, and unlike the smaller animals, brook trout, cutthroat trout, sometimes rainbow trout, as soon as they get to be about a foot long, they stop eating bugs and they start eating fish which explains why they get to be so big. And they also spawn in the fall, all right? And they're common in larger rivers. So San Miguel, Dolores, Gunnison, Colorado, that's usually where you'll find bigger brown trout. They can tolerate warmer water than cutthroat trout or brook trout, so they can be found at lower elevations and in larger streams. Okay, so now let's talk about cutthroat trout. Notice the differences in the spots. Notice the differences in the size. Hands of a fellow that used to work for me named Mike. They're smaller. That's about a nine inch fish, totally an adult, probably three years old, as opposed to that brown trout that took two hands, right? Okay, they are the only trout native to Colorado. I promise you, all right? They once occupied all the streams from way up in the mountains all the way down to the Colorado River and the Gunnison River and the San Miguel River, and the Dolores River. All right, they were the only trout. And in fact, there aren't a lot of native fish species to Colorado. So in a lot of places, they were the only fish in, the, uh, in those ecosystems. So coming back to your question, Miss, if you think about when we talk about competition in a second, think about the fact that cutthroat trout spent hundreds and hundreds and millions and millions of years without another fish species to worry about. And if you don't have, let's see, who's an only, is anyone an only child? I wasn't an only child either, I had a sister. But if you're an only child, do you have to worry about getting beaten up by your big brother or big sister? No, but if you've got big brothers and big sisters, what do they like to do to you after a while? Beat on you, uh-huh. I did it, my sister did it back to me. It's all good, right? It's part of growing up. Think of it this way when you think about competition. Cutthroat trout didn't have a big brother or a big sister, so they never learned how to fight back. They never learned how to stick up for themselves. 
All right, so use that analogy when we talk about competition. Now currently, the only place you're gonna find native populations, what I call aboriginal, meaning they were here before, say, Lewis and Clark, you can call them native, all right? The native populations that weren't stocked, that are still remnant, got there by themselves, they're found in higher elevations, up higher mountains, and in smaller streams, okay? So, cutthroat trout are a very diverse species. All these different colored blobs on this map, you can see, I hope you can see this is a map of the western U.S., California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and there's Colorado, oh wait, sorry, there's Colorado, Oops. right, Wyoming, Utah, all right, all the different colored blobs are different types of cutthroat trout, as scientists believe they existed before Lewis and Clark, and that's how I measure time when talking about native and non-native, kind of think of before Lewis and Clark and after Lewis and Clark, right? Okay, so before Lewis and Clark, we think it looked like this. And this sort of reddish blob right here, that sort of looks like the letter lowercase h, that's Colorado River cutthroat trout. That's the trout that was native or is native to this part of the world, all right? There are others, Greenback over here, Bonneville, Yellowstone, West Slope, Rio Grande, all different versions of the same thing, okay? But the point of this slide is to show you that it wasn't just one cutthroat trout spread out over the western U.S. Lots of different forms, lots of different sizes, lots of different biologies and ecologies, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so recognize this map. This is the national forest here. The land management agencies like the Forest Service and the BLM and the animal management agency, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, manage native trout. The currency of that management is what we call a conservation population and it has to do with their genetic purity. So rainbow trout and cutthroat trout can interbreed and make babies. But if that happens, you have the non-native rainbow and the native cutthroat trout, and the resulting fish, while I'm sure is great, would not be a native. It's only when genetically pure cutthroat boys and girls get together and make babies that you maintain a genetically pure population. We call those populations conservation populations. All right? And you can hear that term if you talk to a parks and wildlife biologist or me or someone from the BLM or anyone. This is the currency of conservation for native cover trout, conservation populations. So, and I apologize for the size of the slide, but all these little squiggly black lines are conservation populations that we know about on the forest that I've personally found or were found before I got here, all right? We have 44 of these on the forest, either wholly or partly on the forest. Like you can see, there's this squiggly line right here that comes down off the forest over by Gunnison and Crested Butte, all right? So we have 44 of these known populations, and my guess is we at least have four or five more that we haven't found yet. I've been on the forest for four years, and I've averaged finding two populations per year just by going and looking at places that we haven't looked in a long time. And then you take a piece of their uh, fin, you can send it to a lab in Boulder, and they can do like a DNA fingerprint on it, and they can tell you is it a native or is it a non-native and where it came from. Pretty cool. All right? So when I'm doing my job every day in the forest or at my desk, I'm thinking about these conservation populations. How do I protect them? How do I make more of them? How do I find more of them? Okay, so let's talk about cutthroat trout biology. I believe you have some sort of little section of your note page, you might want to jot a few notes down while we talk about this, okay? All right, so, like most salmonids, S-A-L-M-O-N-I-D-S, salmonids, with the root salmon, salmonids is just a fancy term for trout and salmon, all right? So, it's basically a constant that Colorado River cutthroat trout, what I abbreviate to as CRCT, they like clear, cold water. So the cleaner the water, the more likely you're going to find a trout there, right? Whether it's a brown trout or a rainbow trout or a cutthroat trout or a sockeye salmon or something like that, you're not going to find them in hot, muddy, nasty-looking streams. All right, 
So they like clean water and cold water. All right? Unlike many other salmonids, cutthroat trout feed almost exclusively all of their lives on insects. All right? They will occasionally eat fish. You can catch them on flies and lures that look like fish. But for the most part, cutthroat trout eat stream insects all their lives. They're most active in the morning and the evening. When do we go fishing? We go fishing in the morning and the evening, and then we have picnic and take naps during the day, right? Waiting for the good fishing in the evening. They're most active, just like elk and deer, in the morning and the evening. That's why you go fish for them at those times. And they may move long distances. Cutthroat trout and their cousins, salmon, rainbow trout, incidentally, all the salmon, the king salmon and sockeye salmon, and rainbow trout, and cutthroat trout all come from the same genus. Do you guys know what I mean by genus? Genus and species, scientific name? They're all in the same genus, Oncorhynchus. And one, uh, don't worry about spelling that. I can never remember theirs. I always get an R and an H screwed up, so don't worry about that. All right? One characteristic of all of the Oncorhynchus is that they move a lot. Next time I show a picture of a cutthroat trout, look at their body. They look like a torpedo. They're really good, like a tuna, moving through water. They move all the time. And the slide says, in these small streams, they move, they move hundreds of meters, hundreds of yards in the summertime. And I know that doesn't sound like much. It's like from here to the parking lot. But for a six-inch animal, that's like going across the country. All right? Because movement is wasteful. Why do we run? Why do we ride bikes? To stay in shape, to take care of those love handles. When you're 41 like me, you've got to start worrying about the love handles, right? So we run and we ride bikes because it burns energy. In nature, where you, when you don't know where your next meal is coming from, you don't want to move. You want to sit around and hang out. So the fact that they will move long distances and a lot is pretty interesting. All right, and lots of research has been done on cutthroat trout in small streams finding out. We used to think they would just find a place and hang out, like in a hole, right? Just in a deep part of the stream and hang out there, let food come to them. It's not the case at all. They're constantly moving up and down and up and down. And before Lewis and Clark, cutthroat trout would do what salmon and steelhead do. They might be up high in Fall Creek or Elk Creek near Woods Lake to spawn but then they would move down to the San Miguel to spend the winter, where there was more food and less ice, and the conditions were more hospitable. So these animals move a lot, they migrate a lot. It's a seasonal migration. That's what salmon and steelhead do. They're migrating. They migrate to the ocean. What's in the ocean? The food. They get huge, then they swim back up to make babies. And that's it. In the case of a salmon, like a king salmon or a sockeye salmon, they die. You know why they die? They die because they don't eat when they're swimming upstream to spawn. They digest themselves on the way. Then they physically can't live anymore because they have no guts because they ate them, which is kind of weird to think about. All right? Yeah, but also awesome because the fact that they are a three-foot-long animal can go a 1,000 miles just to make babies it's pretty sweet and not eat. That's pretty impressive. Yes? <laughs> why, do you, like, why do they go to the ocean and like, I don't know, like eat and then go a thousand miles to have a baby? Okay, so they, I really hope I just didn't break something. So the re, we already touched on why they go to the ocean. Why do they go to the ocean? What did we say? To eat. To eat. So think about the, really think about it. Think about even the San Miguel River. All right. Have you ever heard of a 60-pound fish in the San Miguel River? No. no. It's physically impossible. There is not enough food in the San Miguel River. Right? And so they go out into the ocean where there's tons and tons of food. Ton literally, tons and tons of food. And they hang out there for one, two, three, maybe four years. And they get huge. Well, the whole time they're out in the ocean, it's like a big buffet. Right? Back in the mountains where they spawn, and this is an excellent question, by the way, 
back in the mountains where they spawned, where they were born, there could be floods, there could be landslides, there could be eagles and ospreys, there could be giant forest fires. There aren't disturbances like that in the ocean. And so over evolutionary time, the millions of years that these animals have been doing this, because they didn't all go to the ocean, they started by maybe going a couple miles. And then a million years later, they were going 50 miles. And a million years later, they were going 100 miles. And on and on. And what has happened is, they've developed a strategy just through natural selection. Have you guys heard that term, natural selection? Just the forces of the environment on a population, right? They develop a strategy where they can go out, get humongous. Well, who do you think makes more babies? A four foot king salmon or a nine inch cutthroat trout? A four foot. A four foot king salmon. A female king salmon can lay out like 6,000 eggs. You might get 700 from an adult cutthroat trout in a stream in Colorado. So there's a benefit to getting humongous in the stream because you make literally thousands of babies. All right? And there's no parental care, no parental care for baby fish in this case. So the more babies you make, the greater probability one or two of those babies grows up to make more babies. Follow up? So what they do is they like get pregnant, go to the ocean, eat, and have babies? No. No, they go to the ocean as juveniles. So the same age equivalent to you guys, all right? So everyone, when I'm done, get up and just start walking to the ocean, okay? That's about the point in life when salmon and steelhead go to the ocean, all right? Then they hang out there until they're Mrs. Colbert's age, or Alessandra's age, or Matt's age, right? Okay? So you're an adult, you're huge, you can't really grow anymore, you feel that pull, it's time to make some babies, all right? So they head back upstream, and when they finally get to the point where they came from, and salmon can hone into within yards, within yards, if I was a salmon and I was born right where you are, young man, I can smell my way within a few feet of you. Oh, that's scary. It's amazing. It's scary and amazing, right? And that's when they get pregnant. The boys and the girls fall in love, get together, make some babies. And the whole cycle resets. Go ahead. It's like, it's not, I don't know if it's a fish, but it lives in the ocean. How come the male seahorse has a baby? <laughs> so that could, that could be one of our conversations that we have later in Bass Lander. We can talk about that yeah. on Tuesday. Okay. Let's stick with fish. I actually went to the Monterey Bay Aquarium in Monterey Bay, California, and I saw male seahorses having the babies. It's kind of a neat little, they do this neat little dance thing. Right. One more question and then we're going to move on, so I've got time. Well, this is, so, where the salmon go when the lures meet, and there's catfish in the lures, and then trout and this, and then they put the things together. Mm -hmm. Can catfish live in this part of No. Uh, no, catfish like dirty, relatively hot water. So they won't come up here and that happens in every place. Imagine the Mississippi River, right? The Mississippi River goes to the Gulf of Mexico. It goes all the way up into Minnesota, right? And at the top, where the Mississippi is only a few feet wide, it's cold and trout live there. But as you get down, it gets bigger, dirtier, hotter, and the fish pop community changes to fishes that are adapted to warmer, dirtier water. Incidentally, catfish, not native. I'm going to move on. Hold your question, please. Okay, so the term thermal ecology, your, Mrs. Colbert asked you about ecology. For that, what do you guys think thermal ecology means? Anyone? Someone who hasn't called on yet. Go ahead. Cold-blooded and warm-blooded, that's one way. Go ahead, Miss. Mm -hmm. Thermal means temperature. So it's how temperature, environmental temperature, affects cutthroat trout. Cutthroat trout are warm-blooded or cold-blooded, right? Which one? Cold-blooded. Cold so they get their heat from the environment. Unlike us, we make our own heat. Right? We're mammals, we make our own heat. Fish, lizards, 
amphibians, they get heat from the outside world. All right? When thinking about fish, all fish, all fish everywhere, water temperature is the most important environmental factor affecting them. Okay? It's, it's not even close. Water temperature is so important because when it's cold, they can't move, they can't eat, they can't swim well. When it's too hot, they die. And when it's somewhere in between, they can live. And this is the mechanism of climate change and how it may and is affecting stream fishes in the western US, all right? Okay, so these are important numbers. You do not have to remember them, except while I'm talking, because there's gonna be quizzes as we move along. The optimal summer stream temperature, don't worry that it's in Celsius, the optimal summer stream temperature for cutthroat trout is 12 to 18 C, all right? So that's about 54 to 68 Fahrenheit, okay? 12 to 18 C. That's optimal for making babies, for growing, for eating, and for swimming, all right? If you get outside that range, below 12 or above 18, you see a lot of what are called sublethal effects. What do we think sublethal means, anyone? Go ahead. Sublethal, less than lethal. It doesn't kill them, but they're not doing so hot. It's like when you have a cold, it doesn't kill you, but you're not your best. If you're on track team and you've got a cold, you're probably not going to run your fastest mile, right? Probably not going to do the best on the test if you've got a wicked headache. That's what sublethal effects are. So, when you get above or below that range of 12 to 18, they don't feed as well, they don't grow as fast, they don't move as well, they don't make as many babies. That's important. As soon as you get above 26 degrees Celsius, they die. All right, just for even a short amount of time. Now, it's not like a switch where the temperature gets above 26 and then they just keel over with X's on their eyes. <laughs> they can take a little bit, but if you have that 26 happening regularly in the summertime, they will die. Yes, ma'am. How come the Celsius affects Because. And this is a question Ms. Colbert can deal with throughout the year. But everything that animals and plants do, grow, feed, move, reproduce, is dictated by the functions of molecules called enzymes. And enzymes work in a particular range of temperatures. And when it's too hot and too cold, then your enzymes aren't working properly. And that's why. All right? I'll be happy to come back and tell you all about enzymes, because I know a lot, actually. But you'll all fall asleep, so you better be sincere if you invite me back to talk about enzymes. All right? So let's talk about life history. Let's talk about... Murray, please call the office, please. Murray. Come on. Murray. Go to the office. Come on, Murray. I know. Rude. All right? Okay, so cut their child life history. Don't worry about the picture. We've got mama here, right? Mom makes eggs. Eggs make little tiny babies that hatch out and they hang out in the gravel where they're born. And then as soon as they soak up their yolk sac, because they have a yolk sac, right? And they become these little creatures called eye, they move out of the gravel and start to feed and grow. Yes, sir? Um, so when the mom, uh, I don't know what you could call it, lays the eggs, I guess? Uh-huh. So other fish can eat them, but what? You know, that's a really super question, and that people have looked at that, and that does happen, but a lot less than you would think. You don't really think that fish or fishes are very smart, but there's something wired in their brains that keeps that, it's just a form of cannibalism that minimizes that cannibalism, right? I don't know what it is, but it does happen, but not really routinely. It's just like when they're little ones, you know, one and two inches long, it just so happens big fish of the same species don't tend to hone in on 
babies of their same species. I don't know why, it's just something Mother Nature has wired up, which is pretty sweet. Right? Good question. All right, so cutthroat trout spawn in spring, usually around next month, about the second week of May. All right? And I apologize for how small the font is. The females build a nest called a red, R E D D. All right? And that's in gravel. All right? A female cutthroat trout can lay about 700 eggs. The fry, which are the little babies, they look like fish. The little babies, they're usually out and about swimming around by August. Okay? They used to move long distances. So, for instance, if they live up, I mean, one close to home, lived at the headwaters of Natarita Creek, they would come down into the San Miguel de Dolores to spend the winter, then they go all the way back up to the headwaters of Natarita Creek to spawn. All right? They don't do that anymore. All right? And in the wild, a cutthroat trout can live three to seven years. And a really big cutthroat trout is 12 inches in nature. Yes, Alessandra. What do you call the stage where they just hatch from the egg? I can't read it. Oh, this is, I usually call them sack fry because they have this little sack. But the word they have there is alevin, A-L-E-V-I-N. OK, so here is a map of Colorado, Utah, Idaho, Wyoming. All right? And all of these gray squiggly lines right here. We've got some here, down in New Mexico and Arizona bunch in Utah, up into Wyoming, all of this on the western slope of Colorado. All of these gray squiggly lines is the historic habitat of cutthroat trout. All right? That's where they were before Lewis and Clark. Now, if you squint really hard, and again, I apologize, you can see all these little red lines, little clusters of red, right? That's where they are now. Okay? So their historic range was basically the whole Colorado River Basin, which is that's what this polygon delineates here, just the only Colorado River. But they're only found now in teeny tiny pockets of red. All right? So quiz time. Why? They occupy about 14% of their historic range. That means 86% has been abandoned. Why? Why do they only occupy 14%? What are some What are some reasons? You. The competition. Competition from non-natives is a good one. You. They never learned to fight back. They never learned to fight back. So more on competition. What about human effects? What have we done? Yes. Fishing and eating. Fishing and eating. It does have an effect. But there's another thing that we've done. Humans have done since we settled the West. Yes, in the camel. Uh, water. water pollution is one. That's what you're going to say? Is that what you're going to say? All right. Water diversion. Oh, Whose family is in agriculture? Is anyone family in agriculture? Yeah? Grow hay? Grow corn? Grow quinoa? Whatever we can grow up here at 7,000 feet in Norwood? Right? Right? Or cattle? Right? We divert water for cattle. Whether it's a big giant diversion like this or a little diversion like that, water diversion has created barriers to movement and isolated habitat. You know what I mean by that? Isolated habitat, meaning it got this thing. There's some people standing on it. It looks to be about two times, so that's probably 12 feet tall there. You think a 12-inch fish can jump over that dam? No. 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 So barriers are a big one, little and small. Little barriers aren't actually barriers at all, but what happens is, during the irrigation season, where do the cutthroat trout go? Down the ditch. Do they come back? No. no. All right. Non-natives. Competition from non-natives. Rainbow trout, they're in the same genus as cutthroat trout, Uncorinthus. They can make babies. And I alluded to this before. When a rainbow trout and a cutthroat trout fall in love and make babies, the result is not a cutthroat trout. All right? Okay? So there's two mechanisms of competition I want you to think about. There's the genetic mechanism, which is interbreeding with rainbow trout. So when rainbow trout and cutthroat trout get together, they just all fall in love. All right? They don't look at each other. And to go with the Harry Potter references, they don't look at pure bloods and mudbloods. 
right? They just fall in love, okay? All right, and then the young lady asked about this, and the reason I have it so big is, this is the number one reason, brook trout. Oh. Brook trout. We put brook trout here. We put rainbow trout here. Seven billion dollars a year fishing brings to the Colorado economy. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I'm one fisheries biologist for three million acres of national forest. I have to pick my battles, and my battle is against this thing right here, right? What I call the beast. All right. Has anyone heard of Trout Unlimited? Have you heard of the group Trout Unlimited, the conservation group? I once gave a talk right before Christmas to Trout Unlimited, and I referred to Brook Trout as the beast, and they got really mad at me. Because they, they really got mad right before Christmas. But I got mad back, so it worked out okay. All right? Okay, so you asked about competition, and here's how it works Brook Trout spawn in the fall. All right? So their babies are eggs through the winter, and they hatch very early in the spring. Cutthroat trout spawn in the spring, and then their babies hatch later in the spring and early summer. So technically, those brook trout and cutthroat trout are the same age. But the brook trout have been out swimming around and eating for longer, so they're bigger. And when very little brook trout and very little cutthroat trout get together, they fight for food in space, and the little cutthroat trout lose. Once a cutthroat trout gets to be this big, nothing really bugs it. Maybe an osprey or an eagle. But when a cutthroat trout is tiny, it can't deal with other fish wanting to eat the same things that it eats, wanting to swim in the same places that it swims, wanting to hide in the same places that it hides. And that's why. That's why scientists have spent years and years and years looking at this. And the only thing they've been able to find is that when the fish are Fishes are tiny, tiny, tiny. The brook trout beat up on the cutthroat trout. And then those little cutthroat trout die, or they don't grow well. They certainly don't grow old enough to reproduce. And that's the mechanism of competition. It's the same for all life. Trees compete for sunlight, right? We compete on the athletic field. When you're older, you might compete for the love of another, right? Elk and deer grow antlers and bash on each other just to find does and cows. Competition is part of life, all right? And you have two animals that look the same and live in the same spot, they're gonna compete. And because cutthroat trout did not grow up with big brothers and big sisters and cousins, they stink at competing when they're little. And that's it. Seems pretty simple, all right? Kind of like deer and elk, elk get, or the deer get chased off by the elk. Absolutely. I saw 75, I saw about 100 elk this morning driving over Dallas to buy. And the 12 deer I saw were trotting away from a dozen elk. And I've seen that elk hunting before too. First elk I ever shot, I knew they were there because deer came running right at me. Which that didn't make a lot of sense. All right? Okay, so let's talk about cutthroat trout and climate change. Don't worry about these busy, busy graphs. These graphs show that same Colorado River Basin, right? This is the Colorado River Basin four times. And this was done by a friend of mine named Amy Hawk, who works for Trout Unlimited. And she evaluated climate change based, uh, um, excuse me. She evaluated things that could affect cutthroat trout as climate change. So for one, increasing stream temperature in summertime. We talked about the importance of stream temperature. If it gets above that 18 degrees C or above that 26 degrees C, that's bad. All right, so that's one mechanism. Every red blob you see here, those are places where water temperature could grow so hot that it could affect cutthroat trout. Increased risk of wildfire. Hotter, drier summers, less snow, more flashy rain, more lightning means more wildfires. All right? And it has already been demonstrated by scientists that in the last 25 to 30 years, wildfires are becoming more frequent and larger. It's true. All right? 
So all the red blobs are places where we could have more and bigger wildfires, which could affect cutthroat trout. Increasing frequency of drought conditions. So drought would be low snowpack, not a lot of rain in the spring, like last year. You guys remember 2013? Yeah. Horrible. Worse than 2002, which I guess when I moved here, everyone talked about 2002 being the drought of the century. 2013 was worse, right? Note how much red is there. Lots and lots of places are prone to more and greater drought. More and greater drought means hotter water, less water. We'll talk about that. Increased risk of flooding in wintertime. You might think that doesn't make much sense, but in the wintertime when the water is cold, the fish can't move. They can't get out of the way of disturbances. So if you have a bunch of snow and ice and then it warms up and you get a big rainstorm, what is called a rain on snow event, it causes a landslide through the stream. Fish can't get out of the way, they get ground up. All right? You see a lot on the western slope, a lot of potential for that. Okay? All right, so just a quick rundown. I don't want you guys to obsess too much about this because you can't see these very well. But all these red dots here, this is Washington, Oregon, California, just to orient you, so this is the western US. All these red dots in the left panel are places where we have been measuring air temperature for decades, and the air temperature is on the rise. It's above average, measurably above average. All the red dots in the right panel are places where there's less snow and rain. Okay? So, the take home of that is air temperature is rising, precipitation in both snow and rain is becoming less common and more variable. Spring runoff, that's when the snow melts off the mountains and fills the streams. Usually, that happens slowly, right? The snow doesn't all come off in like one big woof, right? Right? Slow and steady. What keeps water in the streams in August and September is the snow that is melted and percolated down into the earth and then percolated through the earth into the stream channel. But spring runoff is happening earlier. All the red dots are places where spring runoff has been measured to happen earlier. The biggest red dots, that's three weeks earlier. Three weeks earlier, which is a lot. In 52 week year, three weeks is a lot. That's a huge leap forward. Okay? So the take home message is air temperatures are rising. Don't care why, they just are. All right? Stream temperatures are following that trend. Drought is more common and more severe. Spring runoff is happening earlier. And the risk of high severity forest fire is increasing. These are ways climate change could affect cutthroat trout and other stream fishes, including rainbow trout and brook trout and brown trout. Okay? All right, so I want to switch gears a little because I want to demonstrate to you that there's not a debate about whether climate change is happening or not. It's been proved. This creature is a bull trout, and it's a cousin of brook trout native to the Pacific Northwest as far east and south as Idaho. Totally cool animal. They get to be huge. Huge, like three and a half, four feet long. All right? And they make long distance migrations, not out to the ocean, but into big rivers. And where I came from in Idaho, I spent four years studying bull trout, moving through a stream system, sometimes 75 miles, which is a tremendous amount. Okay, so scientists that I used to work with in Boise took stream temperature data from 1993. All right, I was, um, I was 21, all right? And stream temperature data from 2006. And the stream temperature data were taken in the same places. And they just said, I wonder if the stream temperature is risen. And then they looked at habitats that was suitable for rainbow trout and for bull trout. Now zoom in on the bull trout. Anybody see any green blobs in here? No. no. Anybody see any black blobs? Yeah. yeah. Every place was a black blob is a place that was suitable for bull trout in 1993 and is now too hot in 2006, which was eight years ago. They demonstrated just in the 13 years between 1993 and 2006, stream temperatures had risen almost two degrees Fahrenheit. So it's happening. It's happening. 
And again, I don't care why. But this has a really important effect on bull trout. Bull trout spawn at like 38 degrees Fahrenheit, which is six degrees above freezing. They love super duper cold water. So even a little increase in stream temperature can affect bull trout. Bull trout, by the way, are protected as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. That's why so much energy has been devoted at bull trout. Okay? So the take home message from this is not black and red lines. It's that science has shown it is actually happening and it is affecting an important animal in an ecosystem. Okay, so we can do, we, I do the same thing on the GEMA. I collect stream temperature every year. All these little black dots are places where I've taken a stream temperature sensor and glued it to a rock in a little house. And they're only about the size of a half dollar or a quarter. All right? And they can take, because of computer science, they can take a temperature measurement every 30 minutes for nearly three years. And then I can go get the little thing, pull it off the rock, put it into a computer, and whoop, there's my stream temperature data. And every year, I have about 50 of these things out glued to rocks, and then I put about 30 more. So I have about 75 out across the entire GEMA. And then this is my friend, Missy Tracy, who worked for me for two years. And you can't see it, but there's a little white dot right there that she's pointing at on this rock. She's just glued a thermograph to a rock in Coach Toba Creek over by Gunnison. All right? So we take those, and we can use all the stream temperature data to do exactly what I just showed you in Idaho. All right? And we can figure out what the temperatures are now, and then we can compute what the temperatures will be if climate warms a degree, two degrees, five degrees, whatever it will be. So here's what the data look like. It's a lot of data, right? This is just a summer's word. This is July 1st, and July is our hottest month in the Rocky Mountains. July is the hottest month, all right? So you see hottest temperatures in July, dip in August, come back up in September, and then by the time you get to November 1st, you're down near zero. So that's what kinds of data I get from these little thermographs. Okay, so now we're gonna play Make sure I've only got a few more minutes. Now we're going to play a guessing game, or a little hypothetical. Green, too cold. Yellow, just right. Red, too hot. Let's play a hypothetical with climate change. Ten years later, temperature goes up. Ten years later, temperature goes up. Ten years later, temperature goes up. Okay? Do I need you to be done? You have one minute. Okay. So now, I leave you with a question. Conservation biology for cutthroat trout is about two things, and it's for all animals and plants, actually. Two things. Protect what you have and make more of it. So let's look. I need my glasses because I'm old. These are actually bifocals, which is totally embarrassing. All right. This is the Uncompahgre Plateau. There's the Nanaria Creek. This is the Grand Mesa. Gunnison. If you were me, where would you work? to make more cutthroat trout habitat, and why? Someone, shout it out. Someone said the red. But if that red is too hot, would you work there? Over in the Gunnison. Look at these areas here. Green left. Green down here in the Cimarrons. Green up here. North east, north and east of Crested View. If you were me, you would look in these places. decision that I have to make where to invest time and money and energy. Okay, so he's not finished, right. so settle down and let him finish, please, and then we'll pack up. Hold so, down. thank you very much for coming. Please look me up. I will leave my card with Ms. Colbert. She actually has my email. If you have any other questions, you need me to come back and answer some more questions, I totally will, because it gets me out of guilt. <laughs> All right? So, thank you very much, and have a great day. Hey, go ahead and... Right, we're clapping.